Good day and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. Please allow me to welcome you to this edition of our 2020-2021 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. Today, it is my honor and privilege to welcome our speaker, Dr. Hong Wei Dong, who is Professor of Neurobiology at the University of California in Los Angeles. Dr. Dong received both his MD and his PhD in China, after which he became a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Dr. Larry Swanson at the University of Southern California. Following his postdoctoral fellowship, he was a founding neuroscientist at the Allen Brain Institute in Seattle, Washington, where he worked to construct the original Allen Reference Atlas for the brain of the C57 Black Laboratory mouse. This atlas and its revisions have been at the core of many Allen Brain Atlas research projects, research products, papers, and other resources. Dr. Dong began his faculty career at UCLA in 2007 in the Laboratory of Neuroimaging, where he pioneered several white matter fiber tract tracing methodologies, um, publishing many papers in prominent journals. In 2013, he and his laboratory relocated across Los Angeles to the University of Southern California. He's recently returned to UCLA's Department of Neurobiology um, to take on a professorship there and to continue this painstaking work. He's sponsored by uh, several grants from the National um, Institutes of Health's Brain Initiative, um, and his research focuses on uh, the multiscale wiring diagram and cataloging of cell types in the mouse brain. Most notably, Dr. Dong is the founder and director of the Mouse Connectome Project, uh, mouseconnectome.org, which is a valuable resource for understanding uh, the brain connectivity in the standard laboratory mouse. Uh, as noted, he has received funding uh, through the NIH Brain Initiative, and at one time was listed among the top 1% of uh, NIH-funded researchers. Again, the work in his laboratory includes that painstaking work involved of track tracing studies of neuronal fiber pathways in the brain of the C57 black laboratory mouse, and uses uh, computational methodologies to examine the rich patterns of neuronal connectivity and to make inferences about the wiring patterns of the standard laboratory mouse brain. Today, his lecture is titled, um, uh, Beg your pardon, hold on. Today his lecture is titled uh, Assembling uh, uh, Global Networks of the Mouse Brain. And um, as always, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube. And if you're watching on YouTube, thank you for joining us. Uh, also, our specially selected 2020-2021 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are encouraged to submit any questions for Dr. Dong via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and ask them on your behalf in the last 10 minutes or so of Dr. Dong's lecture. And with that, welcome Hong Wei. We are very, very excited to hear your lecture today. Okay, uh, first I want to thank Jack. Uh, you invited me to give this talk and talk about our uh, work in the last 10 years. And that was a very nice introduction. Thank you very much, Jack. All right, uh, so my laboratory uh, in the last 10 years, as what Jack mentioned, uh, we're trying to map the brain, map the neural circuitry. And this project is part of the brain initiative. And uh, um, for the one major uh, topic for the brain initiative uh, is try to understand how the different, many neurons, eight, six billion neurons that's in human, but it's uh, uh, in the mouse brain about a hundred million neurons, how these different neurons, they connect to each other, uh, form the neural network, conduct the uh, different behavior functions and uh, how the different disease, uh, what's happening when the circuitry gets uh, disrupted and how that one relates to different disease uh, models. And uh, uh, obviously this is not the easy task. Uh, in the mammalian brain from mouse to human, there are about 800 to uh, 1000 different brain structures. Our mission is to try to understand how these different brain structures, they are connected with each other individually at the regional uh, level and also eventually will be at a, a, a single neuron resolution. So obviously the brain is organized at a, as a highly organized hierarchic uh, networks. So obviously from the first is the brain and the brain itself can be uh, subdivided several major 
uh, subdivision, cerebral hemisphere, cerebellum, uh, lower brainstem, and each one of them in turn uh, can be subdivided uh, multiple uh, structures, eventually go to the individual uh, brain structures and then subdivisions and then um, uh, sub uh, individual neurons. That is uh, the ultimate uh, resolution is look at the individual neuron resolution. So when we map the brain, we can follow obviously the different principles. So one principle is just like our human body. Uh, you look at it topographically, what's happening in the head, forelimbs, the lower limbs, uh, and in the brain, basically you can look at the, the cortex, uh, basal ganglia, thalamus, hypothalamus. That is the one way to look at topographically. And another way, uh, is uh, follow their system level. Just like in the human body, at the beginnings, you can look at the, for example, circulation system that you got the uh, veins, uh, um, artery, and a heart, and they organize as a networks or muscle system. So in the brain, also the same thing. Uh, this uh, uh, diagram that is from Cajal's original joints, and here he showed is the dorsal root uh, ganglia cells send the process to the skin and uh, receive this sensory information uh, getting to the spinal cord and then this information goes up to the thalamus then go to the cortex from cortex can send the uh, projections directly to the spinal cord and innovate motor neurons and that innovates the muscle so basically that is across uh, multiple stations that is the whole system so that is a one level we can understand how these different brain structures they organized as uh, networks. So again, I show you this is another Cajal's original joints. You can see beautifully showed in the retina has multiple different cell types. Each individual neurons, they have dendrites receive the input and axon go to the next uh, target. And this, uh, here's a, a tectum and uh, send the projection to here and uh, the neurons here also receive inputs to go to the uh, its own target. So it's uh, from one station to another one. Uh, so overall in the last several decades, uh, so we, entire neuroscience um, is in particular for anatomy, what we're trying to understand always is the three major things. One is the different cell types in the individual brain regions. And in terms of their circuitries, the one is the local circuitries, how the uh, locally uh, individual neurons, they affect with each other, especially for local circuitries. So we talk about the interneurons, uh, they affect the surrounding neurons. And for long range projections, we really look at their extrinsic connections. So if we look at the diagram, like one individual brain regions, they send projections to the downstream and also receive input from upstream as a chain uh, connections. Uh, but we should keep it in mind uh, is one individual brain regions, obviously you can uh, keep subdividing into the smaller subdivisions and in the, at the regional level, we look at, we use classic tracer, so we can look at the regional per connections, input, output. But at a final resolution, each individual regions also contains multiple different brain, uh, di multiple cell types. And these individ individual cell types, their connections can be really different. And uh, uh, eventually what we go to the single neuron resolution. So, uh, another uh, major thing, what as a neuroscientist, we map the neural circuitry is, uh, we not only uh, producing the data, just the, that is one major thing I wanna emphasize as this uh, brain initiative connect home. So our mission is not only just producing large amount of data, but really even more in, uh, important thing also uh, is to understand uh, this data, convert this uh, uh, connectivity data, imaging data into the usable knowledge. Uh, just like uh, uh, Cajal, originally he got this beautiful joints here, but you notice all these little arrows here to show you how the different part of uh, uh, the structures, they connect with each other. Uh, this obviously is a classic uh, trisynaptic circuitry from internal cortex to dental gyrus to C3, C1, uh, these circuitries. That's our job as a neuroscientist, neuroanatomist. We're not only producing data, but also 
really understand how this data, what that data means. And uh, um, one important thing is for each individual nodes in these uh, connections, they can receive the multiple inputs. For example, these nodes N2 here receives the multiple inputs, uh, receive the convergence inputs, but also uh, uh, they can send a projection downstream we didn't put it here, but it's also it's sent to the multiple inputs to the multiple target, just like N1 here it has one target here, another target here. So which means like when we look at map the circuitries, we start from individual brain structures as one function of nodes, uh, see their inputs, see their output, but also we need to understand from the multiple nodes how these uh, eventually put together these networks, how they interact with each other. So. Uh, overall, if we look at the entire brain, how they connect with each other, it's almost just like this piano. The piano has a fixed number of, uh, of keys, but with different combinations, they can play infinitive uh, music piece. So our brain, the automate, uh, the, the basic elements that is motor neurons, but with different combinations, they can conduct different behavior different functions. So the neural circuitry itself, that is for how to organize these different individual neurons, individual brain structures, and for the uh, more higher and higher level uh, complex cognition, emotion, and behavior. So overall, that is my introduction. I just talk about like our overall, my program is like uh, uh, try to understand the first things, understand how the whole brain constructs the whole brain wiring diagram. And uh, uh, then we try to understand each indiv individual brain structures, their, their, how many different cell types. And then we need to understand at single neuron resolution, their input output um, organization. So this mouse connectome project, as Jack mentioned, we started this pro project uh, about 10 years ago when I was at uh, UCLA. Uh, that was uh, a start beginning with uh, together with Allen Institute, uh, their uh, connection uh, project, and also Cold Spring Harbor has another brain architecture uh, connectivity project. So this is three major projects to map the mouse brain uh, mesoscale connections. Um, so this is one of the uh, example uh, images I want to show. Uh, so the, our um, connectome project, we use multiple fluorescent tracers, can label multiple pathways at the same time. So for example, this is red color fibers bundles that is come from uh, a secondary motor cortex, and this is a green color that is from infrared limbic cortical areas, you know, at the same time we also label the neurons. Um, that's the individual neurons, they project back to the cortex. So, um, so in my talk today, what I want to uh, present is in our last 10 years of work, we start from this map, the uh, cortex, to look at how entire cortical, different cortical areas, they connect with each other, they form these different cortical, cortical networks, and then systematically look at the entire cortex, they project to the stratum, and then look at the from stratum, uh, their projections to the downstream pallidum nigra, and from here project back to the thalamus and then back to the cortex. Uh, the reason for that one is because it's an entire cortical uh, basal ganglia thalamic circuitry that is one of the most uh, functional motifs in the brain, uh, involved in many functions, involved in many uh, disease. So the, for the cortical basal ganglia, this is the in human brain. You know, we know they have the caudate, putamen. Here's the massive cortex, and also here's the uh, uh, globus pallidus, and here's uh, the nigra. Uh, this is in human, and in the classical classic view for uh, cortical basal ganglia system is uh, they form these several parallel uh, major uh, uh, major loops called cortical basal ganglia, ceramic loop, and eventually back to the cortex involved different functions like a motor and uh, eye movements and uh, cognition, emotion, things. So in the last 10 years, we did the systematic uh, studies, refine this uh, entire cortical basal ganglia, ceramic loop. So first we look at the entire cortex, this uh, mouse 
uh, new cortex. This work uh, was published in 2014. And uh, the method we used is called double co-injection, which means like in each individual brain, we uh, do the stereotactic surgeries, make two injections. Each injection uh, contains one retrograde tracers back label their upstream neurons at the same time uh, uh, label their downstream projections. Uh, so one's floral gold, BDA actually now we use more as AAV and another injections we uh, retrograde tracer that is a uh, color toxin anterograde tracer is uh, PHL. So in this case, in one brain, we can map four parallel uh, pathways to anterograde to retrograde. And so here's the examples to show this uh, uh, control lateral side of secondary motor cortex. Axons come from the injection site and uh, this uh, retrograde labeling neurons project back to the injection site. Here's their uh, samples of the uh, labeling neurons. And uh, here's one example injection site. You can see the axons come from injection site, go to the control lateral site, uh, generate axon terminals. And here's terminals at the same time, the retrograde neurons also here. Uh, these neurons project back to the um, control lateral site. And when we see this overlapped anterograde retrograde, we know this region and this region, they have reciprocal connections. So for the entire mouse cortex, we use the 300 injection site, uh, which means uh, because uh, remember each injection site, we have a mixed uh, one anterograde, one retrograde. So which means like we have totally 600 pathways. So we select uh, 240 pathways. We generate this uh, uh, connectivity map in the entire cortex, use different colors, map their uh, different pathways. Uh, so for example, like here, we showed is uh, all this entire uh, somatic sensory cortical areas, primary motor, secondary motor, primary sensory, secondary sensories, and totally is uh, all these individual somatic sensory motor areas. And then we look at their pathways. And then we find out uh, this entire somatic motor pathways, they are organized as several uh, parallel subnetworks. For example, all this green color labeled pathways that is in the control, the upper limb uh, movement, include the primary motor cortex has their upper limb domain, primary somatosensory has their upper limb domain, and secondary uh, motor cortex has their uh, upper limb domains. And it's a green, uh, blue color that is for the oral facial, and the red color that is for more lower limb. So basically it's a total is a three, four, two, uh, four parallel different, different uh, subnetworks can show different part of a somatic sensory motor cortex uh, uh, functions. And also uh, another major networks, we call it media networks, which means uh, includes the visual cortex, auditory cortex, and uh, uh, ritual splenic area that is received direct input from hub campus. So basically it's the information from outside world, visual, auditory, and spatial information. These guys, uh, they, they share massive connections with the ritual splenic area, anterior cingulate cortex, these cortical areas along the midline of the uh, brain. And then they form these high level uh, interconnect networks and then project to the uh, frontal cortex that is orbital frontal cortex. And this network that is really the process the information from outside world. Uh, on the other hand, the cortical areas along the lateral edge of the cortex, for example, and agranular insular cortex, internal cortex, and temporal uh, association areas, these guys form two parallel uh, pathways that connect with each other, also connect to the media media prefrontal cortex, they process information from our inner world, that is a visceral, olfactory, gustatory, and self-awareness, this information. So if we put together, uh, conduct this kind of uh, uh, network uh, matrix analysis, we find the entire cortex, they are organized as uh, about a dozen different subnetworks. Uh, for example, like a uh, four somatic sensory motor areas, two media subnetworks, and uh, two 
uh, lateral uh, subnetworks. They are organized as these uh, um, uh, functional networks conduct a different behavior. And uh, uh, interesting, all of these connections, they have the interactions around in the frontal area that uh, I think that is information can allow the entire cortex information, they flow this uh, uh, interact through this, uh, uh, among these different subnetworks. So overall, that is our work for map the entire cortical uh, networks. So after that one, our next step was we uh, look at how the entire cortex, they interact with the stratum, because the stratum, that is the first station receive the input from the entire cortex. And this work uh, is the, to do that, uh, we, we made the injections into the, all the different cortical areas, and then to look at their projection patterns in the mouse stratum. And uh, interestingly, we, we saw almost like no identical uh, uh, labeling patterns in the stratum. For example, these injections in the primary somatosensory cortex, their terminal uh, field of man is here. You see their terminals like uh, this pattern. Uh, but another way, the parietal association areas, they show this kind of a band. Um, another injection is in the visual cortex, they show this a vertical band uh, near the lateral ventricle. So basically, it's overall the from individual cortical areas, they project to the stratum. They not only show this heterogeneous, their distribution patterns are different, but also even their terminals, how they distribute in the stratum also is really different. So, and then we generate this detailed map uh, for the axon terminals from individual cortical areas, put them together. You can see their uh, distinguished topographic patterns. Some cortical areas, they have more overlap. Some is relatively segregate. So basically we can see the how the from different cortical areas that they are convergence and divergence in different part of uh, stratum. And uh, then we can conduct this uh, systematic uh, quantitative analyze for their terminals in the stratum. So, this part, I don't have time to go to the detail, but however, we just really look at from each individual cortical areas where they are really dense terminal core and also they are diffused terminals around because this one has a different functional meanings for the uh, inputs to innovate the different stratum uh, part. And then we look at uh, topographically how different part of a stratum, their terminals correlate with a different part of a stratum. For example, the green color, that's a uh, uh, somato, uh, somatic sensory motor areas involved uh, this uh, uh, lower limb trunk, uh, no, actually it's upper limb, uh, our official part, the projections mainly go to this uh, ventral lateral uh, side of the uh, stratum. Uh, this part mostly is involved in orofacial, this orofacial upper limb area. But uh, the, for lower limb and the trunk part, they project more dorsal uh, side of the stratum. And this yellow part receives input from this media subnetwork, the visual, auditory, retrosublinear area, anterior cingulate cortex. And this pink area receives more as input from classically, we call it limbic system, that is uh, in the agranular insular. Temp uh, in a uh, internal cortex project of these areas. And if we look at even more detail, conduct a more uh, detailed network analyze, we really look at the entire stratum, we can subdivide them into the about 30 uh, different functional domains. Uh, each of these individual functional domains, they receive their special uh, set of the cortical inputs. Uh, so, for example, like here, that's, uh, again, that is the uh, uh, entire somatic sensory motor area. Remember, they form the distinctive subnetworks. So we can see how these different subnetworks, they project to the uh, stratum. But they, the here interesting things, like their projection to the stratum, they form this uh, upside down, this homunculus. So basically, it's like a trunk from a trunk cortical areas of, uh, from primary somatosensory, primary motor cortex. They, if they all relate to trunk functions, they, their terminals in the uh, dorsolateral stratum. 
For the orofacial parts, they are more like ventral lateral side of the uh, stratum. So they have this, some part overlap, some part of uh, divergency, but overall is remember in the cortex part of they have like a somatic sensory, somatic motor. The, if they are form the uh, subnetworks that control the trunk or lower limb, they project to mostly overlap terminals in the stratum. So if the, their mouse regions, they project to the ventral lateral side. So again, uh, so the uh, for the uh, visual auditory and it's the media networks, they mostly they project to this uh, dorsal medial region of the stratum. But the insular part and also internal cortex, they project to the ventral lateral side of the stratum. And again, this one that is uh, really is, uh, highly correlated with the cortical networks. And if the cortical areas in the cortex part, they heavily connect to each other, they project tend to have the, like more overlap in the uh, same, same domains in the uh, stratum. And here's uh, some really nice, uh, relatively segregated terminals in the stratum. Um, so based on overall, this entire cortical, there are terminals in, this, in the stratum. This, this uh, is a maximum uh, projections of the axon terminals from more than 80 different cortical areas as their terminals in the stratum. Based on this pattern, we can see this stratum uh, clearly, these functional related domains. For example, this dorsal media domain here received convergent input from the visual cortex and the internal cortex, which means this part of a stratum probably involved in the integration of the visual, spatial, uh, visual spatial information. And this part that is for trunk, this part for orofacial, and this part that is for visceral motor uh, input from the cortex. And this kind of a functional map across the entire uh, stratum, more rostral, more caudal, but they have the different special ways. For example, in, in the relatively more caudal part of the stratum, they have segregations, relatively dorsal part, you got like eye, head, neck, trunk movements, uh, all these cortical areas project uh, here, but the limb uh, parts, they project here, and here's more like for our official part. And a more really caudal part of a stratum is involved primarily input from the visual auditory input. Uh, but this part of stratum actually the people knows very little about it. All right, after we look at the entire cortical, cortical networks, look at their entire cortex project to the stratum. And next step is we look at how from the different, this functional uh, domains, ident newly identified functional domains of the stratum project its downstream uh, structure that is globus pallidus and uh, substitution nigra. And then from there, how they project to salams uh, and then go back to cortex. So uh, the question really is if we see the cortex uh, topographic projection to the stratum and the, the, the we identify all these uh, clear subdivisions of the stratum, what is their major, how their, uh, these patterns go to the next step, the pallidum and the nigra. So this part of work still not published, um, but uh, um, we already saw very clear, very interesting patterns. For example, this is from stratum, uh, their projection to the uh, globus pallidus to show all these really clearly segregate domains. And this is from the major divisions, intermediate uh, stratum, rostral, caudal stratum, they show these patterns. Uh, but also if we see the community levels, the dorsal, me, lateral, ventral, me, lateral, dorsal, medial, ventral, medial also sees relative separate patterns. But interestingly is if we go to really fine domains in the stratum, they also show the clear pattern in the pallidum. And the globus pallidus sees these patterns, which means the cortex inputs to the stratum, they relatively segregate, and then they can also maintain this uh, relatively segregate uh, projection patterns in the pallidum. So accordingly, uh, I showed these functional domains, and then we can try to find the correlated domains in the pallidum. So we divided the pallidum into the uh, about 40 different domains. Uh, this is just like uh, the Legos, the piece, and each domain they receive specific inputs from different part of a uh, uh, stratum. 
And also we look at how from the different stratum demand they project to the uh, substantial Niagara. So remember like uh, uh, the individual stratum demands, they receive a uh, very specific input from the in individual cortical areas. And, but uh, I showed here that is more like uh, several demands in the ventral medial demands of the stratum. To look at each individual demand, they project to this uh, uh, different part of uh, uh, Niagara. And then put it together, we can also uh, see this uh, functional uh, specialized demands in the in the Niagara part, and uh, we mapped these circuitries also at the individual uh, neuron resolution. Which means, like here, uh, I showed this, uh, several individual neurons to see their axon, individual axons. They go to the generated branches in the pallidum or the terminals in the Niagara. So that is a high resolution inputs. Uh, high resolution axons. And then after we look at the Niagara, uh, so from the stratum to the Niagara, and then we look at from uh, individual Niagara, how they project back to the salams. Like here, I use the example that is uh, uh, for the uh, called uh, uh, parafascicular nucleus, PF, uh, salamic nucleus, these guys, and receive the same domain of this uh, PF receive the inputs from cortex, but also receive the uh, cor correlated demand from the um, stratum, uh, from the subscription Niagara. So which means like, uh, if this part of uh, stratum uh, receive the input from the, uh, the cortex, the correlated cortex, and we can find the, how the, in the salams part, they are cortical inputs to this Islamic nucleus, and actually it's received the convergence input from the substitution Niagara. So in this case, you form this kind of an entire cortical basal ganglia salamic cortex, this kind of a loop, uh, just like what I showed here. The, the same uh, salamic domains, they, they project back to these cortical areas, and the same cortical areas project to this salamic nucleus. Uh, this one project to stratum, uh, but this part of uh, stratum project to the uh, uh, cor corresponding demands in the Niagara and a Niagara project back to the Islamic nucleus. And then this guy uh, project back to the cortex. So in this case, we can really, really see how this entire cortical basal ganglia Islamic loop, they form this kind of a really interesting uh, uh, close subnetworks. And uh, uh, we also uh, mapped uh, these uh, neurons in the uh, Niagara, what is their morphology, their individual neurons, how their dendrites extend throughout this Niagara part, and also uh, how this, uh, their dendrites match with their inputs from the uh, stratum. So overall, um, so overall, um, I don't have time to go to the really detailed every subnetworks, but overall, the information here is this. So entire cortex, uh, we have uh, three major uh, networks, large, relatively large networks. For example, somatic uh, sensory uh, motor networks, they uh, can, they are organized as several parallel networks control trunk, lower limb, upper limb, inner mouth, outer mouth, uh, these regions. And then each individual subnetworks, they have primary motor cortex, primary sensory, secondary motor, secondary sensory. Uh, the, each one of these subnetworks, they heavily connected with each other in the, at cortex level. And then these guys, in the same subnetworks, they generate convergent inputs to the stratum, the same domain. It doesn't mean their terminals, they are completely overlap. They still show some, some interesting pattern, but they project the same domain. Uh, what we need to understand is as this stratum individual neuron resolution, how this individual neuron uh, the information from different cortical areas, they integrate at individual neural resolution, but that is a future work. Um, 
And uh, you see like the somatic sensory motor parts, they converged into the different subdomains, mostly the uh, lateral side of uh, uh, striatum that is correlated to the human putamen part. But the media uh, associative net subnetworks that is uh, includes anterior cingulate cortex, regional splenic area, parietal association area, orbital frontal cortex, they project to the dorsal medial stratum part. And uh, lateral uh, cortical areas, they project to the ventral medial stratum part. But each individual domains in the stratum, they then send the parallel projections to the pallidum. At the same time, they send interesting convergence, divergence, and patterns to the different part of a, a substitution Niagara. And remember, stratum also has projections to the pallidum. Pallidum, they have projections to the uh, uh, Niagara. So which means like uh, if we bring in our classic concept, direct pathways versus indirect, indirect cortical basal ganglia pathways, uh, but they organize in you know, a different uh, principles. I don't have time to go to the detail for that. Uh, but eventually, when we see this Niagara project back to the salams, use the parafascicular nucleus as examples, they also form these parallel pathways from here, then they project back to the entire uh, cortex. So this work is not completely done yet, but I think like down the road in the next several years, we're going to uh, go to even more details to see each individual, for example, like at the uh, Niagara part, individual Niagara neurons, how they receive the convergent input from the stratum and also from pallidum. And how this, uh, you know, another really clear question is how these uh, pathways, uh, individual pathways, if the pathway get disrupted, how that one relate to like a classic uh, disease, for example, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease. You know, because in these different disease models, for example, Huntington's, the, the Huntington's, they show different symptoms. For example, at the beginning stage, people has a problem, patients have a problem for, for their eye movement, and then they have a problem for swallowing food. That means they have some problem with our official motor part, and eventually it's come to the so really limbs uh, problems. And they also have cognition, like both the hun uh, hun Huntington's and the Parkinson's patients, they have cognitive problems. And cognitive problems actually come before even motor uh, problems. So I think like if we, uh, we really mapped all these networks really clearly, uh, and we, because we know lots of functions about the cortex, for example, uh, media prefrontal cortex that is involved lots of uh, cognitive functions uh, and anterior cingulate cortex involved a different function from the motor cortex. And then we, uh, if we understand how the individual cortical areas, they go to fine uh, demands in the stratum and this stratum, how they affect the downstream projections, pallidum, nigra, and to the salams, that will really help us eventually understand this really much finer um, resolution just in terms of the, for the, uh, disease model. So uh, I just, uh, I don't have time to go to the uh, really detail, but it's like another really major direction. Uh, so in my lab, also it's one major direction for uh, brain initiative in the last several years. And also uh, the, the, the coming next five years, that is uh, to characterize uh, cell types for the entire uh, mouse brain. Uh, so which means we look at, for, this is the one example for the hippocampus. So the hippocampus obviously has many different neurons. What we can show here, for example, this green color neurons, that is a neuron project to the anterior ventral ceramic nucleus. You can see these neurons, really complex dendritic arbors, and each dendrite has all these dendritic spines, you know, we know this dendritic spines, that is spot to receive the inputs. Uh, and it's a pink color neurons, that is a project back to the ritual splenic areas. And all these red color neurons, that's the neuron project back to the um, reunion nucleus of the thalamus. So, dance, so that direction really also is we, uh, what we, uh, we need to characterize catalog neuronal cell types 
uh, at the single neuron resolution to look at their inputs and also the single neuron output. And uh, this work will be uh, really is a, a tremendous work, uh, very labor intensive, and uh, uh, but it's involved uh, many, uh, many groups in the country. Um, all right, so overall, uh, I introduced my program as like a, we how to generate this kind of a multi-skill wiring diagram, uh, uh, use the cortical basal ganglia slamic this uh, uh, system as an example, and uh, uh, to show how we go from the regional specific level uh, and go to the subdivisions and eventually need to go to the individual resolution. And also I briefly mentioned uh, the, another major direction is to catalog cell types in the brain. Uh, so uh, for this connectome project, obviously that is, has been ongoing for in the last 10 years. And uh, people have used different technologies, try to understand this connectome at a different resolution. Uh, in the neuroimaging field, obviously we have lots of like a human uh, micro uh, MRI, DTI at this resolution. In the mouse world, we use this kind of a classic tracers, use the virus tracers to label the neural pathways. And then in the uh, electro, microscopy resolution that is go to really synaptic, synaptic resolution. Uh, so eventually what we really want is to integrate this multi-scale resolution connectome to help us to really understand how the brain organized uh, at the uh, different levels eventually will be needed at the uh, single neuron resolution. So when I work on this project, really uh, one really good example uh, I want to put here is uh, to show this kind of a story. This is a blind man with elephant. You see like the different, the little man, so they touch one body of the elephant and then report, okay, the elephant, this guy report elephant just like a wall and this guy report the elephant just like a rope. Um, so this kind of a, approach really just like you know we, we scientists we as a scientist many times many years what we are trying to do is because we uh, use special technology we focus on different brain regions and we really focus on one region and then we generate our hypothesis for example if we really work on part of our brain and we collect this information we generate a hypothesis and then we just use this hypothesis to demonstrate okay my hypothesis is right uh, I think the elephant is just like a wall, you know. So, so it's it's a scientific evidence. But on the other hand, uh, we need have a global view. So hopefully, this connect home, this project eventually we can integrate the information uh, from all different modalities, uh, different uh, the disciplines. Uh, so and then can give us a big picture of what the elephant is. Um, so that is a, really is a bring up into this data science. So why is the data science really important? Really is not only just we generate data, but eventually we need to understand this data and you know, what that data means. Okay, um, I can stop here for my talk. And uh, so I, uh, this is my lab, and uh, uh, obviously um, my work is involved not only just uh, the for generated data, but also involved lots of computational part. I didn't uh, talk elaborate here, uh, but it really just that is a contribution, great contributions from my lab over years. And especially for uh, Hori, she uh, made a tremendous uh, contribution for the organized uh, the project to help the have, help the project really ongoing, and uh, uh, Nick uh, Brian involves the major papers here, and Im Bowman that is uh, um, he's uh, our informatics group leader, and Muya Ju developed a lot of uh, great informatics um, tools, and also the rest of the lab uh, did all the great contributions, and also my collaborators in my different brain initiative. Uh, project and uh, I really uh, appreciate the support from Brain Initiative and uh, NIH. Okay, so I can stop here and uh, take some questions and uh, thank you very much for your attention.
Uh, Hongwei, thank you so much. That is just such a tour de force amount of work and uh, just a lot of work by a lot of really great people too, who many of whom I happen to know personally. And so it's, a, it's so nice to see it all come together. Uh, one of the things which is always kind of uh, interesting to think about is I, I, as I understand uh, your choice, you chose the, to, to look at the C57 black mouse because it's the most ubiquitous laboratory animal in the world. And that understanding the brain of that uh, example species would be really important for, um, for others. You know, just in terms of its ubiquity, their, uh, the, the genetic homogeneity of it, um, it would just made a really great model. Uh, but I'm curious because it has been so studied and has been so looked at did you, what is the really, the, the thing that really got you excited as the new discovery of looking at the brain of this particular animal? Yeah, so we pick up these mice. It's not because, uh, one reason is really just because it's a practical. And uh, um, we study the neural circuitry eventually to try to understand their function. So for the C57 black, that is the most popular models for the genetics. So there are so many genetic disease models use, this, use the mouse. And uh, uh, molecular people, they, they use this one. And uh, all the genome people, they, they you also use mouse brain. And uh, also in terms of size, in terms of neural circuitry, because it's much smaller, it's easier to le you look at the entire mouse brain. I don't have the time to talk today, but like uh, recent years, we start using the uh, light sheet microscopy, uh, do the brain clearing, and then to look at the entire mouse connection patterns. So the mouse brain is relatively smaller. So give you the um, opportunity to map the entire uh, brain rather in comparison with the rat and uh, monkey's brain, they are much bigger and then that will be involved even more. Uh, one is the labor, another thing is really data size. And also the mouse really the most important thing is because we can directly correlate it, use the later on for people use the genetic model. So we, when we look at the uh, circuitries in the wild type mice and uh, we can use this, the same circuitries people can understand in the disease models, how that uh, happened. Um, that's being said, but recent years for the brain initiative start to really think about uh, like uh, use the monkeys because for us, automated goal is really is understand human brains. So the primates, for example, mummicide, that is a really good model uh, to uh, for us, the next step after we understand the mouse to see the in the use mouse in the use uh, mom set to look at uh, in the primates what's the circuitry is common in the mouse brain and what is the difference and that mom site can be as an intermediate station for us to really understand the human brain, but obviously eventually. Uh, we need to see in the human brain how the connectivity compared with mouse brain. Uh, many of these circuitries we learn from mouse can be applied in the human. For example, this uh, uh, cortical stride projection that I just showed. Uh, my thinking is we find the really finer subdivisions in the mouse striatum functional domains. The same thing can be applied directly in the human brain. And obviously still, uh, lots of work needed to be done for a human brain. And that is, uh, we're waiting for some new exciting technologies coming out in the next several years. And do you plan to do any work with um, kind of disease model mice? I mean, it, it sounds like you uh, alluded to that. Are there any specific diseases that uh, you would want to try to uh, to look for, uh, look at the connectivity of in mouse models? Yes, yeah, so we have been trying to look at the uh, this connectivity in the Huntington's disease uh, mm -hmm. and also AD mice. Um, but uh, to go to the disease model part, you know, that's also is really, uh, it's not uh, the easy task. So we need to devote our time specifically to work on this model, you know, but that is definitely, that is the direction we're going. So we, we uh, at this moment, we really towards to think about is uh, really the Huntington's and also AD and probably also Parkinson's, these three major models. That's cool. Um, 
uh, here's a question from one of our uh, uh, participants. Um, what about parafascicular projections to the striatum? Do they largely overlap with the inputs from cortical regions they connect to? And could this redundancy be a mechanism behind why locomotor control and many aspects of learning are preserved in decorticated mice? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes. So parafascicular, it turns out that actually is a very interesting uh, very interesting structures. I'm just like so happy. At the beginning stage, we didn't expect it's so complicated. And so when we look at our uh, projections, connections, actually it's the reciprocal connections, parafascicular with the cortex, we find the parafascicular nucleus can be subdivided into these multiple domains. And these multiple domains, they are very highly topographically arranged. For example, the uh, parafascicular uh, the lateral part, parafascicular, more dorsal part, that is the more uh, heavily reciprocal connections with the cortex related to control the trunk part, uh, relatively more ventral in, uh, as like an intermediate middle level, that is for the upper limb, and a ventral lateral side of parafascicular nucleus, that is for the control the artificial part. But like a more medial side, or like a dorsal, and eventual side, that is the parafascicular nucleus, really is heavily involved with the classic um, limbic uh, cortical areas, for example, infrared limbic cortical areas. Uh, they, you know, uh, they really is in the uh, media, dorsal lateral uh, side of parafascicular nucleus. Uh, and we, interesting is we, we find is when we map this cortical striatal Niagara pathways, and these pathways from Niagara, different domains, the project parafascicular nucleus really match, just like in my talk I mentioned is the same functional loop, actually they all preserved from cortex to striatum to the uh, Niagara, then to parafascicular nucleus, then back to the cortex. So it's, uh, uh, I think like we, for the parafascicular, we identified six major domains. That is uh, uh, six parallel subnetworks can back to the cortex. Did I answer your question right? I, I, I think that is a, a great answer uh, for that question. So thank you. I hope that uh, our, our uh, participant was satisfied. Um, one thing that you mentioned is the, the notion of looking at mapping the cells in the mouse brain. And I'm thinking of things like um, uh, Broadman's regions, for example, in the human brain, which are so wi widely noted. Um, but I also know that uh, Broadman did some work in his cytoarchitectonic corpus um, in a number of other species, I believe, including the mouse. I'm, I'm curious whether or not you find any sort of mappings that would link cytoarchitectonics with some of the connectomics you're seeing um, and that have overlap between these uh, projection areas and the, the, the regions that you're identifying. Does there seem to be some sort of cell type uh, pattern as well that superimposes itself upon this conectomic pattern. Yeah, uh, so yeah, another project I didn't talk about today here, uh, that is a recent project, um, is a really collaborative project it's among uh, more than 16 different institutes cross country uh, from this brain initiative cell sense network and the organizer for the anatomy part. So in this part, we look at the cell types in the primary motor cortex. So basically, so we define the, the primary motor cortex anatomically, and especially we focus on the uh, primary motor cortex upper limb area. Uh, so we look at the different cell types in this uh, primary motor cortex, they project to the different cell types, for example, layer two, three neurons, layer uh, four, even just uh, we identified the primary motor cortex actually also has a very thin layer, layer four, uh, and the layer five neurons, they project to the different part of the brain. So for example, let's see, uh, in the human, you got like a really a big cortical spinal projection neurons in the primary motor cortex. In the mouse brain, actually, it has, yeah, that, that is basically the same cell types also has these uh, big neurons project to the spinal cord. And uh, we use the tracers to label these neurons injecting into the cervical spinal cord, back label these big neurons in the cortex. We know these guys where exactly where they're located and uh, uh, where they project to. Uh, so we basically identify these uh, uh, neurons 
uh, cortical spinal projection neurons use a different anatomical uh, uh, tracer method, regional specific, and also the, use single neuron. We can see single neuron the project to the downstream medulla, different parts, and then see the branches. But at the same time, also brain initiative sponsored other groups. They look at the individual neurons, what is their molecular uh, profiles. And uh, so what is the molecular identities? So this information can be used actually in the other groups in the brain initiative uh, sponsor groups already compare the same cell types, try to look at uh, cross different species of mouse, monkeys and humans, what is their molecular uh, ident molecular profiles, whether the, you can find the same molecules or different, uh, and then compare their cell types. So eventually, in the down the road, in sex, in the next several years, this information we will you will get we will get the really massive amount of data. Try to compare the different cell types across human and mouse brain, you know, also primate brain. Well, this is, leads me into my next question: is uh, there's clearly an enormous amount of data science which is required to deal with this you know, massive amount of individual cellular data, how they're all connected, what uh, subsystems um, and subnetworks exist in these uh, large data sets. Um, what do you see as some of the things that uh, data science can contribute to? And what do you see as um, kind of attributes that data scientists you know, might have if they're going to come into this field and help analyze this rich amount of uh, neural information. Yeah. So actually, the data science that will become really key uh, for down the road. And uh, for producing data is only the first step. So over the last several years, like uh, uh, my lab, that is a, a Stu's academic uh, lab, it's a relatively small academic lab, but we already produced a huge amount of uh, connectivity data. And we can, obviously, we are trying our best to, to write papers, try to understand how these different brain regions, they form these networks, but still, though we still have tons of tons data just in our computer. Uh, we haven't got time to really analyze that one. And Allen Institute, obviously, that is a big institute. They produce tons and tons of data already it's, uh, in there. They released in their website. But the key question still is how we can understand this data. So, so that one just really come to the, uh, the data science part. We need to develop a more uh, powerful tools um, to really uh, to analyzing data, to especially perform the integrative analyze, joint data analyze. So that is a part of this brain initiative cell sense networks. And uh, that's, uh, I'm involved in this program that's a brain initiative sponsored. Uh, so for this program, they ask every lab uh, in this program producing the data. And then we submit this data to Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center that is as a, a data center for this brain initiative. And brain initiative is going to release this data, make it available to an entire community. Uh, that is the first step, makes this data openly available to the entire community. And then this, after the data available, second uh, uh, approach, second step actually is involved all of us, our we have the brain initiative grants, but also actually the involved should be like for the entire community, try to really understand this neural circuitry data and a single neural RNA sequence data and some spatial transcriptome data, how put this data together, uh, try to understand um, what this data means, especially uh, for understanding new, uh, neural cell types. For the cell types, that is, uh, we define the cell types is a not only we shouldn't define the cell types based on one criteria, based on their connection or based on their uh, RNA, single neural RNA sequence data. Instead, we should, based on their uh, integrative features, for example, these cell types, what is their, um, first is the anatomy location, where they're located. You know, they're in the primary motor cortex or the primary sensory cortex. And also uh, their connections their physiology properties, what is their firing patterns, and what is their molecular identities. Uh, eventually, understand what is their 
uh, function, what this cell type is involved, which behavior, control which behavior, what function. So basically, is when all of this really require the data science to data science to uh, that is involved. Uh, importantly, many different things include the data visualization. Well, thank you, Hong Wei. I really appreciate you sharing your uh, amazing work with us today. Uh, if it is any indication of the just a massive amount of work that's ahead of us, uh, especially uh, where data science is, is related, um, we're gonna have a, a, a lot of work to do, but it's very exciting work. So thank you so much for sharing your, uh, your work with us today. Um, I wanna thank everybody who's uh, part of our uh, a medical Data Science Innovation Lab program. And I wanna thank everybody out on YouTube for uh, taking part uh, in our uh, activity today and throughout this year. Um, we're gonna be taking a bit of a break over the holidays. So we wanna wish you a very happy holidays and uh, just let you know that uh, we'll be beginning again on January 8th, again, 9 a.m. Pacific and 12 p.m. Eastern um, with our Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. And so with that, thank you again, Hong Wei. Um, thank you again, everybody. Have a happy holidays and a safe new year. And uh, we'll see you uh, on January 8th. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Jack. Thanks to everyone.